Welcome to Crows of the Round Table. Welcome to Proles of the Roundtable, where we sit down, have a few drinks, and talk Marxist history. Check out our website at ProlesPod.com, where you can find our back catalog, links to all the resources we talk about, and a whole communist ebook library, along with a few recipes. If you want to extra support us, check out our Patreon, where you can give your hard-earned wages to a bunch of sectarian tankies in exchange for bonus episodes, clothes, and content. Find out more at Patreon.com slash ProlesPod. We wanted to thank this episode's primary sponsor who enabled us to buy this fancy round table. Big thanks to our sponsor, Sociedad Rural. Uh, so today we have Joel with us. Um, thanks so much for, I guess, coming on the show. Uh, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing good, thanks. Yeah. Um, so this is kind of going to be, a, a, I guess, a two-part episode, the, the first of which is going to deal mostly with... Um, you know, the the conquest of Argentina up to like the late 19th century. Is that correct? Yeah, it's um, basically the formation of what we now know as the Argentine state, um, mm. how it how it became a white supremacist settler colonial state through the years. Mm. Uh, it was a long process and there's a lot of things from from way back then that translate to today. So uh, a lot of, a lot of aspects of Argentine society uh, have uh, originate from this time. Sure. Yeah. So kind of, I guess the material conditions that set up where we are, I guess today, um, the, the second part of the episode, which we're going to re- record in uh, a couple of months is going to deal more with that period going forward. Um, a lot of the labor movements and uh, you said some pretty spicy guerrilla warfare. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So in addition to Joel, uh, to my left, we have eight hop and I am drinking Gatorade because I'm trying to stay <laughs> hydrated after an eye surgery. <laughs> Yep, and this is Justin, and I'm drinking pineapple milkshake IPA from Dry Dock, and it's uh, it's really good. It's a lot better than it sounds like it would be. <laughs> and uh, I'm Jeremy, and I'm drinking the same beer that I was on the last episode, which is uh, Mountain Time by Employee Owned New Belgium. Um, pretty tasty. Uh, Joel, are you are you are you drinking with us tonight, or are you? Uh... Actually, I am, but I'm not drinking any alcoholic beverages today. Uh, I'm yeah. staying on the Sherba Mate, which is the Argentine traditional drink. Uh, it's, you know, a caffeinated drink, but it's not without the same uh, side effects as coffee. Okay, nice. So I guess before you start talking about the issue, um, without doxing yourself uh how much about yourself would you like to say um you know why why you're kind of an expert on this topic well i wouldn't say i'm an expert but i did put quite a lot of effort into looking for all of these sources sure Uh, i'm not i'm not a historian either but i'm you know an aficionado i would say um i started being interested in Mainly, it started off with imperialism and then went off to went on to colonialism uh, with Michael Parenti. Uh, when sure, I came across his works and uh, across his basically it was first his lectures, and then when I finished all of his lectures, I started reading his books. I read Democracy for the Few, uh, The Culture Struggle, God and His Demons, The Face of Imperialism. And there was one more as well. Uh, can't get, can't remember it now. But uh, it taught, it opened my eyes to a lot of things. And uh, I started a page on Facebook called Anti Imperialist Parenti Posting. Uh, where Which is where a beautiful I started page. To... It's a beautiful page. Oh, that's page. you? Yes. Yeah. Hate Hop, how did you not know this? I... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
and uh where i i, I uh, started uploading lectures onto there i found uh my my partner in crime who i saw him when he made the the, the image of all you know marx engels lenin stalin and then parenti uh, <laughs> so he made that and it's this my friend andre from new zealand uh, nice. from sorry otaroa and uh we we he started doing what was graphic design and i was doing clips of all of his lectures and now we've gone up to 16,000 likes 19,000 followers um which is more than I we think... have it's, a, it's about four times <laughs> four times as many as we have <laughs> and the the main uh the main idea was to get his ideas out there you know yeah because yeah. he wasn't really that well known at the time I found him and I was like, wow, this guy is really, he knows a lot of shit and he's really cool on imperialism. So it would be good to, because he, he has a third world perspective. He talks about issues that affect everyone, not just the US and Europe. Like, I don't know, <laughs> Slavoj Sizek. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> and, uh, Fuck that guy. And yeah, I thought it was worthwhile. And yeah, that's about it. I also work as a translator uh and on my in my free time i do some uh, I, I work as a popular educator in in a school called uh here in here in the capital city uh, where i teach english uh for free basically uh and i also go to school there because i'm finishing secondary school I haven't finished yet nice and awesome yeah that's about it that's about as much introduction as i can give um well where would you like to begin? Well, you we can start at the conquest. Uh, I went. I went to uh, an archive called Sedinci, which is basically the biggest uh, cultural archive for the left here in Latin America. And I found this book called Indigenous Argentina by Raúl Mandrini. And um, so, basically, this book uh, was made up of a, a lot of letters sent from from here in the 1500s for the first people who came mm. here who were missionaries about their first encounters with um with the native societies here in Argentina so um a bit of a bit of context shortly after the discovery of the americas the indigenous world was divided and conquered in relatively relatively little time the vast regions of the continent stayed, un stayed under native control Wherever the conquistadors settled, indigenous societies were rapidly transformed. The first great pillage, and later the exploitation through forced labour, destroyed the native material bases and social political structures through evangelization and the imposition of Christianity, changing both traditional customs and religious beliefs, effectively contributing to cultural disintegration. This exploitation was carried out in such conditions that it led to the demographic demographic collapse in the continent. So the first regions to fall under the control of the Spanish crown were the Aztec and Incan empires, since their vertical forms of organization allowed the Spanish to infiltrate these empires and place their own vassals at the top. Consequently, the populations that were previously subordinated to the empires would fall shortly after. In these societies, the mita, or tribute, was a main form of economic reproduction. And when the Spanish took control, the tribute that would, want, that would once be directed towards the ruling classes of these empires would be redirected to the Atlantic ports to be extracted uh, and sent to Europe. However, it was different for those societies that found themselves between the empires and the nomadic clans, since this permitted them to trade, as well as having both hunter-gatherer trades found far from the empires, and also the agricultural and livestock production that would be found within the empire. This is why the conquistadors had a different strategy when dealing with these populations. At first, the system of tribute was solely used for the extraction of minerals from a network of mines connected to the famous Potosí, which was the central part in what is now Bolivia, or Peru, I think. Sorry. The interest of the conquistadors later focused on the possibility of using the natives as a labour force, and the zones of the north of what is now Argentina were readily prepared for the agricultural production that the Spanish wanted to settle and extract. 
In the colonization period, many letters were sent to the homeland, overflowing with information marked by the writer's interests. They were concerned about native tongues, a fundamental tool for preaching, and they increased their observations over the customs that would facilitate or hinder efforts towards evangelization. The church played an important role in the exploitation of the indigenous populations through the system of encomienda, which was a form of enslaving the indigenous populations that had been developed during the Spanish invasions of Arab lands. It was also used at the same time when they were colonizing the Philippines. And here I'm going to read some parts of these documents. So one of them says, they have short arches made of very firm woods. So like they're, they're bows. And the arrows are like that of the Turks, but with three feathers on the end. And the other, the arrowheads are made of stone. They are magnificent marksmen, as good as our own crossbowmen, or even better. So this is a pretty interesting detail because they were sort of um, hesitant to attack straight away because they, they saw at first sight that the indigenous populations had quite sophisticated forms of, um, of, of waging war. Sure. Uh, they also had these, um, their, their balls basically on a string what, that they would throw. And one of the, one of the things that they said was that they could use this to make our fo- our horses fall like when they're running. They also mm. were surprised, uh, to see that there was quite an abundance in food rather than a lack thereof. Uh, here's another quote. They eat raw meat and roasted fish and also shellfish with large roasted clams. It could also be sus- suspected to contain great pearls. Another detail that, that they cared about as well was the minerals. So they said in the river Paraguay, there is much gold and silver, great riches and precious minerals. The detail about the food was also important because, um, as you know, Europe was, wasn't in a very good place at this time. They, uh, that's why they came here in the first place. Right. So there was also slave trade here in South America. The slave trade uh, was organized by the Europeans during colonization. During this process, the Europeans had an, had the objective of expropriating the land from the indigenous populations for the crown. To do this, they murdered a significant portion of the indigenous peoples and enslaved the rest. Counting on a massive indigenous labor force, the Europeans discovered that there was a lack of people for doing the hard manual labor that they themselves clearly weren't going to do. And this is how, this is the the origin of the African slave trade in America. An interesting fact was that in West Africa, uh, between the 12th and 16th century, in the University of Timbuktu, during the Mandinga Empire of Mali, the people of Western Africa were, were much more advanced than their European neighbors. It's possible that many of those kidnapped from this zone were mathematicians, astronomers, philosophers, etc. This is a source from Alcide Argumendo, who is an Afro-descendant, the only Afro-descendant uh, deputy in the lower chamber of Congress here in Argentina. Wow. So due to all this, you know, uh, there was a, a lot of culture that was born here in South America as well as North America from the African diaspora. And a lot of it managed to survive through all of the oppression and the attempts at whitening the populations, including different dances, musical genres, foods, religions, and rituals. What differentiates the Spanish colonies from the Portuguese, British, and French is that the wealth produced by the slaves here was directed towards legitimating military power in the territory Mm. and not for commerce. So specifically here in Buenos Aires, between 1777 and 1812, more than 700 ships reached the port of Buenos Aires and Montevideo, with 72,000 enslaved Africans. In 1810, the capital city had around 40,000 inhabitants, and it's calculated that a third were of African origin. For the period of the revolution, the wars of independence, the city was diverse, and it didn't have a white majority. In fact, a third of the mm. population of Buenos Aires were, were of African descent. And many parts of Argentina have hidden histories, like the case of Plaza San Martín in the zone of Retiro, Buenos Aires. Here one would originally find a retirement home, after which the locality Retiro was named. It was the property of the ex-governor Agustín de Robles, 
In 1704, this country house was put at the disposal of companies like the Guinea and South Sea Company, among others, dedicated to the trafficking of enslaved people. <clears throat> the mansion, with its enormous rooms and basements, was used for decades as a deposit for Africans, kidnapped and brought on ships to the new coast during the slave trade. Eventually, the Cabildo, which is, uh, at that time, it, was, uh, it still exists here in Buenos Aires, the building. Uh, at that time, it was where the ruling elites got together with the military cadre and uh, the governors from the colonial governors to make decisions. They decided to move it elsewhere. <clears throat> and here's the quote of why, why they did it. It says, Negroes tend to come full of scabies and scurvy and emitting from their bodies a foul and pestilent stench that could infect the city in its, in its vicinity. So, you know, instead of getting rid of this horrible institution of slavery, what they did was move it elsewhere right. where there was less people that would see it, you know. Right. Now, all of the sources that I have on slavery for this uh, come from El Afro Argentino, which is an Afro-Argentine newspaper here, based here in, in Buenos Aires, which is uh, from the African Diaspora Organization. So the, uh, I guess, the tribute system you said that it began kind of like you know based in the minerals i, I assume like silver and gold yeah um but so how 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 did that transition to like did it begin as a tribute system in foodstuffs at which then sort of transitioned to um sort of more traditional forms of uh agricultural support or did that just happen sort of did it go from tribute to um you know colonial agriculture uh like how did how did that transition take place i guess well when they first got here um when they first started colonizing uh yeah what was what was what first happened was that the tribute system that used to be used for agricultural production they they used it. They first started to quickly exploit the mines. Yeah, they created a mining system that led straight to the port of Buenos Aires, and Buenos Aires was the most important hub of uh, uh, economic relations with the outside. So after this, when the proprietors, landowners, sure were starting to develop as a class. They started to move away from this and into agricultural production. Um, right. Okay. And yeah, later on, we'll see how this ended and what came after. Okay. So um, something that's interesting about the this further north, it's not really part of what's in the Argentine territory, but there was a lot of resistance, indigenous resistance to the Spanish colonial rule. And the most significant one was Tupac Amaru II. Now, he was the son of Tupac Amaru, who was uh, the last uh, Inca. That's what... It, and, and he led an uprising against the Spaniards and failed. And then his son, Tupac Amaru, he led the most important indigenous and independence movement in the Viceroyalty of Peru, which is the, the second base north so there was the viceroyalty of river plate rio de la plata which is the river that divides buenos aires from uruguay and then there was this other viceroyalty uh he was the first to claim liberty of for the whole southern subcontinent from any dependence as much from spain as from incaic monarchic rule implicating that this isn't merely a political separation but instead the elimination of diverse forms of indigenous exploitation, such as mining, mita, or tribute, the hierarchical repartition of commodities, manufacturing, the sales tax and customs fees uh, imposed upon, upon them by the crown. He also decreed the abolition of black slavery for the first time in Latin America. This was in on the 16th of November, 1780. Uh, once everything had already been plundered. Yeah. Right? Yeah, this was this was before uh the whitening that happened mainly here in Argentina. In the rest of Latin America, 
you'll find that there are a lot of of African descendants. You know, it's it's sort of um, something that you see mostly in Brazil and Colombia, but because there wasn't really, uh, it, it it didn't work the same way how those societies developed as it, as it did here. Something that that did happen throughout these uh, throughout the whole uh, Spanish colonial rule was a caste system. So between the 16th and 18th century, uh, the term miscegenation was coined for biological and cultural mixing between European whites, Indian Americans, and African Negroes. Related with miscegenation and the quote-unquote qualities, during the colonial period, a scheme was drawn out to define the different mixtures. The prevailing classes were looking for a whitening or purification of both counterparts in the family. They sp- they aspired to cancel the mixing of, of bloods and skin colours to return what, to what they considered the best qualities, which were white and Spanish, through arranged marriages. In reality, these laws and social values couldn't prevent all kinds of weddings, sexual relations without a formal union or rape or sex trafficking. This is why the three low castes found themselves in the same social space as those new individuals who were considered almost unclassifiable. The objective of the caste system was to have uh, to have the demographic components of these territories located, controlled, and classified. This is from Lopez Beltran from 2009, the source. So the caste system was like this. The white Europeans were at the top. So your, your dad and your mom were both born in Europe. Uh, then you had the Creoles or Criollos, who were usually half European and half American. So also of European descent, but born here in, in the Americas. Then you had the Mestizos, who were basically mixed race, either half in, usually half indigenous, half European. Then lower down, you had the indigenous. And then one stage low was, was uh, the black population. And then even lower were the Sambos, the Sambos were um, people who were mixed race between indigenous and African. And these were the, the, the least, the people that had the worst time during the caste system. And did this, so, like, did this sort of emerge um, like in Spain and then get exported to its colonies? Did it begin in a particular place in their colonies? Was it just sort of like... Because I, I mean, I know I know that this is like like that 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 arrangement is something that is like there are you can see charts which I've talked I talked about in another episode I can't remember which one I think maybe Guatemala, um, but like it's it's well known it's well understood and there's like different like degrees of blood quantum based on how many generations you are removed from whatever your white great 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 grandfather how many times you've mixed together with a different race like how many time in in your times in your line uh your your race has mixed with somebody else like it's just but it's it seems to be throughout the spanish colonies um but like i i guess do you know where where it originated like in the first place i wouldn't know uh where it originated but i'm sure it was uh, a system that was thought out specifically for the domination of the lower castes of uh sure and um what it did was maintain the property titles like this was mainly about property so if you were in the right. higher castes you could uh buy and sell properties however you wanted and the lower you got the least property rights you had so mm. property was distributed to the higher castes that this was the whole point of it do you think this caste system had any th- effect on uh, the frequencies of revolts in either the ad- indigenous or the slave populations? Well, I think it worked pretty well to um, to divide the indigenous from from the enslaved population, putting the indigenous above them. Uh, I think that was the point as well, uh, so that they wouldn't work together to to defeat the guys who are subordinating them. And we see a similar thing with the differentiation of the um, Irish with the invention of the white race in the Americas or in the Northern Americas. Yeah, definitely. 
And well, so um, we're going to go on to the process of uh, independence. So for a bit of context, in this in in seventeenth century Europe, uh, there was a there was a generalized crisis, and there was a, there, there was a few processes that went on in America uh, because of this. So during this period, there was a contraction of European agricultural production and a restructuring of the workforce in this field. While in America, there was a structuring and enforcement of this sector compared to the previous century, when the colonial economies were more concentrated in mining work rather than cultivating on the land. So this sort of explains <clears throat> the the transition from uh, being purely extractivist to a more agricultural economy. So the European economic monopoly was weakened during this time because there was more and more contraband and smuggling. And uh, so the money, that, the, the capital that was going to Europe started decreasing and more capital was staying within the colonial territory. A great, a great deal of these profits had been de dedicated to protecting colonial possessions uh, what this also saw was the the rise of the Creoles as a as a class. So they would be what what uh, I wouldn't say bourgeois completely, but mostly they were like liberal ideologues uh, based in Rousseau and you know like Simon Bolivar. If you think of Simon Bolivar, it's very similar to the to the uh, Libertadores here in the south as well not like you what you would consider like the petty bourgeois or these these were basically uh professionals they weren't necessarily big property owners like like these the the pro main property owners were the white ruling class the the europeans these guys were lawyers um yeah mainly lawyers and different uh doctors they would call them doctors as well um like the, the upper classes would would differentiate themselves from these guys and throughout the whole the whole process of independence uh there was a, a battle going on between the creoles and the peninsula whites which was basically a battle for progress or or for you know staying in in a in a backward society. So the, the Peninsula Whites wanted to keep their power no matter what. And they always negotiated with the Spanish crown. Um, they always wanted to concede things to the crown. Whereas the Creoles wanted independence. They wanted to be the ruling class, basically. Sure. So um, during this time, Buenos Aires was a small village in the outskirts of the empire. It was the last place where the where the ships from the Atlantic slave trade uh stopped before going back to Europe with the money from the slave auctions it was also an important uh port for trade between the foreign powers the city's main source of income and the government in in Buenos Aires was called the viceroyalty of Rio de la Plata or River Plate the port was a huge source of wealth for the power powerful elites in the capital city and this is this is from where from they they exported the the minerals so in 1806 there was a there was a pretty important event that happened that basically set the foundations of what would be popular resistance against um ruling from foreign powers so during this time, uh, it was right after the battles of Trafalgar and Austerlitz, the Western world had been divided into two. Europe was under French domination, while the British would conquer new markets around the world by storm. They would basically dominate the seas. And they were a, de a developed industrial power by this time, but they couldn't do business anymore in Europe. This is what brought them to to expand uh, to all of the all of the colonies we know as what was the British Empire at the time. So the British Crown sent an expedition to the African South. When they were on their way there, they found out that there was a big chest full of 
full of the, all of the riches of the vice royalty, which would soon be sent to Spain. So they changed, they changed the course of the expedition and went to Buenos Aires. On the 25th of June, 1,600 soldiers from what was then the most powerful military force at the time advanced through the streets of Buenos Aires. At the sight of this, the Viceroy, Viceroy Sobremonte, who was the governor um, and the representative of the king here in Buenos Aires, escaped with all of the riches and left the left the, the people at the mercy of the invaders. Sounds about right. It's, it's, it's quite similar to all the other leaders we've had here after him. Yeah. Very typical. Yeah. And um, I, have, I have a message here that was emitted from... General Beresford, which was the the British general who was in charge of the invasions. Um, I'm just going to read it because there's no need to explain. Having noticed that after seizing the park, the black slaves in the city have intended and intend to continue shaking the subordination under which they stand, lacking in the obedience that they owe to their masters and negating all of their tasks, we constitute that they will be employed on this day until they understand that they will continue to be invariably attached to their masters. They will obey with absolute subordination, fearing the most rigorous punishments that will be imposed on those slaves who walk the streets freely. So what happened here was that donated, uh, the slaves were donated and lent by their masters. Um... A lot of them participated in the battles for reconquering and defending Buenos Aires simultaneously. Those, segre those segregated from those, like, there were free blacks as well, and Creoles and whites. Uh, so in, in the very armies, there was a segregation between the free men and the, and the enslaved. The, author the authorities saw the necessity of granting freedom to 70 enslaved people through a raffle between those considered widowed by the enslaved. So by their, a raffle between their wives, uh, with an exception of those who were mutilated by war, who were to be selected especially. The enslaved uh, were basically causing an uproar. So... What was the, like, what was the function of the raffle? Like, that... It was, it was to, to stop this, um, this uproar that was going on because um, all of these people had fought in the war, but haven't hadn't had any any compensation for it. Oh, okay. so it was a raffle to see who would who would be freed and who wouldn't, so that some of them would Jesus. be freed and there would be a general content about it. But there was no real <laughs> intention. That's some like that's bare bones like concessions there there was like, no uh, there was absolutely no intention from the british to free the slaves when they got here at all this was right, this was their right. concession to the slaves to stop the an uprising from happening was like a fucking lotto to see who gets to go free yeah. and what year was this this was in 1806 so oh, shortly so shortly after uh, slavery would be abolished like a few decades after but before this, you know, the British were rampant in the slave trade. They they basically started it and they they made it expand throughout the whole the whole of the continent, the whole of the American continent. So um, the British soldiers marched without inconveniences toward the colonial fort, uh, which is now the presidential palace or the Pink House in Spanish Casa Rosada. They invaded Buenos Aires, but they couldn't find the treasure, so they went to look for the Viceroy, and they caught him on the way to, to Cordoba, and they, they took the treasure from him. What was particular about this, about this is that the oligarchy actually welcomed the British, and some of them even pledged allegiance to King George III at the time, and people weren't happy about this. Uh... Among the voices that conspired clandestinely to overthrow the British colonial rule, Liniers, a sailor, a sailor from Spain who had his own business here, entrenched in the oligarchy with a post in the military, organized a people's rebellion. Many people left their homes to join the fighting in the streets, even fighting with, with whatever they had at hand to, re, to attack the British troops. The people occupied what is now the Presidential Park, or Plaza de Mayo, uh, that's what we call it now. 
until the British lowered their flag in the fort after a 46-day rule of Buenos Aires. Two days after the defeat, the Cabildo uh, named Liniers, this, the leader of the uprising, as the new viceroy. And he was the first uh, viceroy to start making decisions without having to go to the crown first. With, with his new post, he started building his people's militias and um, which meant that now many people would be getting salaries for the first time, redistributing wealth to the lower classes. Uh, with the growth of his militias, the second attempt at a British invasion also met his demise at the hand of the militias. So we're going to skip on to the Constituent Assembly of 1813. On May 25th, the first government is created and, the, and Spanish domination ends. But discussion began on how to organise the future nation. There are two models at play for the country. On one end, the United Provinces of River Plate, with its power centralised in Buenos Aires, and on the other, the League of the Free Peoples, conformed by Corrientes, Entre Rios, Misiones, Santa Fe, Córdoba, which are all now provinces of Argentina, and also Uruguay. This league, led by José Gervasio Artigas, fought for total independence from Spain and for the implement implementation of a federal system which would distribute political and e economic power to the rest of the provinces. Those at the poor invented an absurd accusation of fraud to not let him into the constituent assembly. Though there wasn't a declaration of independence or a redaction of a constitution, the assembly was very important. The National Coat of Arms, Anthem and Currency were created and the 25th of May is declared a national hol holiday. So this is the our Independence Day, the 25th of May. The Assembly also declared freedom from the womb, the womb which was basically... So <clears throat> um, since there were very conservative people in, in the government at the time, they didn't want to abolish slavery fully. So you would be free if you were born from a slave but your parents would still be slaves until the day they died. Um, so this was terrible for, for the, the African population, African descendant population here, because it meant that they would be basically excluded from society. Their parents would be slaves. And there was, a, there was afterwards, there would be a whitening. So they would, they would get with Crayoles because they wouldn't, they would, they, they would be the only way to get property rights at the time and eventually they would disappear into history. So the only, the only African descendant in our Congress right now, her, I think it was her great-great-grandmother was uh, born free. And yeah, this happened. And most people who are African descendants here aren't really black. Uh, they, they, they usually just look like everyone else, or maybe they have some traits, but because there was a whitening, uh, throughout the whole history of Argentina. Uh, they, they also eliminated nobility rule at this Congress and they put an end to a tribute system. They also abolished torture and inquisition and the slave trade. They dissolved the government and created a uniper unipersonal executive power, also known as the Directory. Yeah, it was, it was very different to the independence of the United States uh, here in Argentina. Don't know what thoughts you have about that. What uh, I guess can you explain the directory, like what that, how that functioned, and what it, I guess it looked like. It was basically a central government that would uh, have they would control everything. It was like a full executive power over all form, all all parts of the government. Uh, in the junta, the junta was the the people who were in the government, which was divided between Creoles and white ruling class. Um, cool. <laughs> yeah. We're going to go on to the period which was post-Battle of Waterloo. So the French were defeated in the Battle of Waterloo and the monarchs of Europe took back the power in, in the empires. Um, when, uh, when the French, I mean, the, the period before, the period of independence, was because the French had taken over the, the Spanish crown uh so there wasn't there wasn't really a control over the colonial territories this was when much of the independence movements uh 
uh, rose up in in the continent in the in the the parts were that were under Spanish colonial rule. So after this after this period, uh, due to the urgency of the return of the Spanish crown to get to to recuperate the last rebel territory because they had they had uh, tried to get back all the territories that they they had been had been taken from them by the rebels. Uh, they quickly declared a constituent assemb- a constituent reform in Tucumán in 1816. A year before, Artigas, who was the leader of the, the League of the Free Peoples, organized his own constitutional congress, the Congress of the Free Peoples. Uh, a, bit of, a bit of background to Artiguismo. Artiguismo was opposed by, by the centralists and by the Portuguese crown because it proposed a union of all the provinces, conditionally including Uruguay, into a federal system. Those classified as artiguistas were characterized by their social heterogeneity, from emigrated peoples from the neighboring cities to small landowners, free blacks and zambos, gauchos, which are basically what would be the equivalent of cowboys here, and poor creoles, right. settlers with no property titles, and indigenous peoples like the Guaranias. Uh, Artigas later lost political power in Uruguay for, following the invasion by the Brazilian Empire, which feared a slave revolt, since the Free People's Constitution was federal in nature, in nature and contained the rights to keep and bear arms, universal suffrage, the abolition of slaver, slavery, total independence from colonial or imperial rule, and a land reform and redistribution of lands in which Quote, the most unfortunate would be the most privileged, end quote. Hmm. In 1816, in the Constituent Assembly, when it was time to vote for for the independence from Spain, all the deputies approved it unanimously. After this, um, there were two uh, very important characters in the revolution. One of them was San Martin, and the other one was uh, Belgrano. So San Martin was sent to the Andes to liberate what is now known as Chile because he saw this as a strategic move. Uh, he would liberate because Argentina was separated from Chile by all this mountainous range. <clears throat> um, and he went to Chile first to liberate Chile and then to to drive that force up north. And at the same time, uh, in in the north, Belgrano was sent to liberate this whole area as well. Um, the struggle for independence was just as defined by segregation as colonial society had been. Just as, for example, before the institution of the civil registry, the church was in charge of registering births, weddings and baptisms and deaths. The books in the parochial registries were divided in two, one for Spaniards of European descent and the other for servicemen, in which Africans, natives and their descendants were inscribed. The army was also segregated, though some studies indicate that the segregated formations <clears throat> had had some level of integration. Segregation persisted after the after independence and well into the period of national organization. During the British invasion, slave corps had been created, and in the armies of, of for independence, the state fought the enslaved, incorporating them into free men battalions or free black and tan regiments. As the name suggests, there existed free, free black and tans as well as enslaved ones. Though the official history never evades boasting about the existence of enslaved people, this does overshadow the fact that the liberated Africans were separated from those who were enslaved. This last detail isn't secondary, especially given that the, of, the officials prohibited, prohibited, quote, recently freed slave troops to be put under the command of free black and tan officers producing a possibly explosive convergence. I'm going to talk a bit about this woman called Maria Remedios del Valle, who is basically part of this of this section of independence. Now, she's she's a sort of similar figure to um, Harriet Tubman in the US because of her look. She was a warrior which, uh, a, <clears throat> and a, a black woman. Um, the first page in her service to the army, uh, the Liberation Armies, begins in the resistance to the British invasions, assisting troops 
in the combat uh, combat of Miserere. However, she's mostly recognized for her p- participation in the Northern Army of Manuel Belgrano, which she joined on June 6th of 1810, along with her family. She participated in every armed conflict that this army had, from the defeat of Desaguadero to the Battle of Ash- Ashohuma, passing through the confrontments in Salta, Tuc- Tucumán, Vilcapugio. In Ashohuma, she received a gunshot wound and was held prisoner and tortured by the Spaniards. Like any woman, she had to row against the patriarchal currents. They say she solicited, she solicited the authority to be on the front lines of combat in the Battle of Tucumán. But the Belgrano, opposed to female participation, negated her permission. Even so, she managed to infiltrate herself into the centre of the conflict where she assisted and encouraged the wounded soldiers. This risky decision is what resulted her in being baptized Madre de la Patria, or Mother of the Homeland, by her troops. Her husband and children died on the campaign, another sacrifice Maria Remedios made for the homeland that was just being conceived and would have many mothers of African descent like her. Her return to Buenos Aires was all but glorious. Turning their backs on the commander of the Army of the North, General Belgrano, who died in poverty as a pariah to the Central Powers, what honours could be expected for his troops? Maria Remedios had to fight hard for her due compensation for serving the homeland. Here we have an extract from the case file that her representative presented to the Ministry of War. Miss Maria Remedio del Valle, captain of the army, duly exhibits that from the first call to revolution, she had the honor of having sustained the just course of independence in a way that deserves admiration in the history of the peoples. Yes, Mr. Inspector, though her representation may seem puffed up presumptuously, she makes no exaggeration in her services to the homeland. Instead, she refers, she refers in an accustomed and national way what she suffered having contributed to the achievement of independence of the patriotic ground she eagerly enjoys. If the first oppressors of the Americas are still instilled with fear when reminded of the respectful names of Caupolicán or Galvarino, who fought for our rights submitting themselves to the wide circle of slavery in which our fathers were submerged, maybe they will also remember the name of the patriotic captain Maria Remedio del Valle to admire the firmness of her soul, her patriotic love, and unyielding support for, the, for American liberty, liberty and salvation, for feeding the chiefs, officers and troops who were imprisoned by the royalists, for conserving the, and alleviating them, and for helping many of them escape. She was sentenced by the enemy chiefs to be publicly lashed for nine days. For her spunk, boldness and resolution while fighting in the armed struggle, she received six bullet wounds, all of which were grave, for who for whom she lost in the campaign once defeated, disputing the salvation of her motherland, the lives of her own son, her her other adopted child and her husband, with whom, while she showed herself to be useful, she was enrolled as a state major auxiliary of the Army of Peru, as captain with a salary. The woman I represent has participated in the entire northern campaign and she has the right to Argentine gratitude. The, The Minister of War at the time, Ministro de la Cruz, with the highest war portfolio, portfolio, excused himself of making the decision and referred her case file to the National Congress. But her case file was delayed by General Villamonte, her partner in the emancipatory battles, one day, who one day recognized her in the street and intervened in the legislature for her case to be treated. In the session of July 18th, 1828, having been objected by some deputies, General Viamonte presented her defense. Quote, I met this woman in the campaign of Alto Peru. I recognize her here as she begs for crumbs. This woman is truly worthy. She has followed the army of the fatherland since the year 1810. There, is, there wasn't a single action she didn't form a part of in the north. She was known by the entire army from the first general all the way down to the last officer. She is worthy of being seen too because she presents a body full of bullet wounds and scars from lashes received by the by the enemy Spaniards, and we wouldn't permit having her begging for handouts like she, she feels the need to today. Finally, 
On November 1st, 1829, Maria Remedios was ascended to Cavalry Sergeant Major, and in 1830, she was included in the Major Unit Corps of Invalids, with a salary integral to her class. On April 16th, 1835, she was destined to, to, active, to the active Major Unit by decree of the then Governor, Juan Manuel de Rosas, augmenting, augmenting her pension sub, substantially. Her military case file claims her death on November 8th, 1847. Maria Remedios del Valle died as the warrior and heroine she was, achieving recognition by the army in which she belonged. Today there exists a bill that proposes erecting a monument for Maria Remedios that has been delayed in the Congress since 2010. In April 2013, law number 26,852 was sanctioned, instituting November 8th as the National Day of Afro-Argentines and Afro-Culture in her honour. This is a translation of a, an article from El Afro-Argentino written by Federico Pita, a, a political scientist here in Argentina. Um, so that was a bit of a, a bit of a detour. Um, yeah, no, it was awesome though. Yeah, I thought it was important to talk about because it doesn't receive recognition here. No one knows who she is. Even the people, a lot of people who study history don't know who she is. Uh, yeah. And yeah, it would be really cool to have a statue, badass statue of her instead of, all of the all of the fucking white guys that we have, you know. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Big same. Yeah, well, yeah. I'm ready to start knocking down Columbus statues around yeah. Colorado. Um. So continuing on, um, by 1820, the wars of independence had met their goal, and the whole of the of South America had liberated itself from Spanish domination. However, the battle was now was now was to establish a new system. The, the Unitarians on one end wanted to, consti- to constitute a government that was centralized in Buenos Aires. The Federalists on the other represented the interests of the provinces and fought for a federal, federalized system in which the provinces would have a bigger role in the decision-making for the region. The post-colonial era broke economic ties, ties between different regions in the territory. The provinces imposed their will on Buenos Aires. In 1820, resenting the central government for its centralist and monarchist intentions, Estanislao López and Francisco Pancho Ramírez from Entre Entre Ríos defined the power of Buenos Aires in the Battle of Cepeda, where the centralist troops were defeated and the Directory and the Congress, the main bastions of centralist rule, were dissolved. A key factor in this was the lack of support from San Martín, who disobeyed orders from the Directory to defend the capital, as he was focused on fighting against the Spanish colonialism in the region and not against his compatriots. With this defeat, a new period of political decentralisation begins. For many years, there wasn't a central authority, but instead a handful of provinces, each with their own governments, headed by gaudichos, or chieftains, who were who were local economic and military figureheads, members of the most prestigious and influential families from the provinces. Their power derived from from the support given by those families and from armies formed by the rural militias, known as montoneras. Uh, Another factor was that they, they were all landowners. During this time, the provinces of La Rioja, Santiago del Estero, Córdoba, Salta, Santa Fe, Entre Ríos, and Buenos Aires were named as provinces for the first time. So the next period we're going to go into was the governance of Rivadavia. Uh, in 1826, he was sworn into presidency after having been government, and new civil confrontments were set off when he tried to re-centralize the power. Uh, naming Buenos Aires the capital and sanctioning a new unitary constitution that would make the United Provinces governed by a central government abolishing the colonial cabildos and implementing universal male suffrage. During this time, the church was also reformed, abolishing the church tax that charged 10% tax on all proprietors and leaseholders' profits. It was like basically like mandatory tithing? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. <laughs> All right. The then. church Fair was a uh, very big player in in the whole colonization. Uh, sure. Even even after this, uh, they they were still involved in 
in what was the I mean, colonization didn't stop a Spanish rule. Then there was Argentine colonization. Uh, we'll we'll be looking into that a bit more uh, further. Uh, his government, his governance was also marked as a defining moment for Argentina's tendency to accrue debt, as a loan was given by the Baring brothers in London for one point five million pounds to refurbish the port. But half of this money didn't even reach Buenos Aires, and after taxing and custom fees, the remaining half million pounds was never used to reconstruct the port. It would take the state a century to finish paying the debt. Jesus. This period also saw important changes for Buenos Aires. The the richest speculators had lost much of their fortunes due to using their wealth to fund provisions for um, for the revolutionary armies. Besides, the free commerce established by the revolutionary governments forced them to co- compete with English businessmen who were very in- experienced and powerful. Commerce became the last option for these elites to increase their wealth. It seemed to them that an opportunity was to be found in the countryside. In the lands that were first conquered from indigenous people, the ruling classes established their farms and bred livestock for salted meat and leather production. This is how a new powerful sector of society was constituted, the landowning aristocracy. They rejected proposals of independence, constitutionalism or unification, discussed by the liberal thinkers, who they would call doctors insultingly. They would only agree to surrender resources to conquer more land from the indigenous or to force the gauchos, who until then had worked autonomously on land that had belonged to no one, to submit to working those same lands for the land for the new landowners. The Unitarian government of Rivadavia sanctioned the Empitusis Law, which would lease state lands to pay back the debt and, rest- and restrict their selling off. The backlash was a real problem because in 1828, General Juan José Viamonte combated the clause in the law that prohibited the buying of lands from those leaseholders who utilised it. The proprietors allowed these doctors led by Bernardino Rivadavia, to exercise power in Buenos Aires as long as their politics were unilateral to the interests of the countryside. As a consequence of concentrating land through this law, from 1822 and 1830, 538 proprietors obtained 8,656,000 hectares of land. The leaseholders being the largest beneficiaries, many collaborators with the Rivadavia regime, between them, the families Anchorena, Alzaga, Alvear, Ascuénaga, Basualdo, Bernal, Bosch, Bustamante, Castro, Díaz Vélez, Dorrego, Echeverría, Escalada, Escurra, Irigoyen, La Carra, Lastra, Lynch, López, Migens, Obarrio, Ocampo, Ortiz, Basualdo, Olivera, Otamendi, Paez, Rosas, San Val- Sainz Valiente, and others. These are the, the, the surnames of the aristocracy today. They're the same families, the same names. Jesus. And you even find that the people in our government today are related directly. Um, for example, one of them was uh, Rosas, but with a Z, not with an S, uh, the Minister of Security right now. Her name is Patricia Bullrich Poirredon. Bullrich is one family. Boyredon is another, and she's also married with a Rosas. So she's <laughs> completely, you know, uh, in, how do you say? Uh, inbred. Oh, yeah. Inbred. inbred. Yeah. <laughs> uh, these leaseholders generally paid little or no taxes in the provinces, so this law tended to favour the great concentration of properties into a few dozen families. In an attempt to annex Uruguay from the Brazilian Empire due to the lack of resources for fighting an external war, since many resources were allocated to fight it, fighting the federales within the country, the collapse of both the government and the national bank which funded this war, Rivadavia accepted uh, his defeat with, Bra- with Brazil and handed them back Uruguay in a death blow to his reputation. The elites who put him into power demanded his resignation and and took over the Buenos Aires provincial government. The most prominent representative, Juan Manuel de Rosas, assumed the gov- as governor of Buenos Aires in 1929. Uh, who was this guy Rosas? He was the biggest landowner in Buenos Aires. 
and he received uh, support from the other landowners as well as the lower classes, both in urban and rural areas, because he was a, a federalist. During his government, the prosperity of Buenos Aires was consolidated thanks to a policy that favoured the development of the livestock industry, bringing Argentina into the international market and preserving the privileges held by those at the port and customs office. So this guy, even though he was a federal, he maintained the power of Buenos Aires throughout his whole uh, mandate. Uh, this, however, opposed unitary, unitarian intentions of national organization. The Unitarian League was formed to re-establish the 1826 Unitarian Constitution, headed by José María Paz, who was one of the surnames we read before, the governor of Córdoba. In this league, Córdoba, Tucumán, Salta, and Mendoza, San Juan, San Luis, La Rioja, Santiago del Estero, and Catamarca joined forces. In response, Rosas signed the Federal Pact of 1831 between Buenos Aires, Entre Ríos, and later Corrientes. Article 15 established a representative commission from, from the provinces composed by a deputy from each province that signed the pact. Uh, the commission would invite all the provinces of the Republic during a period of full liberty and tranquility to join the Federation through the Federative General Congress. The country's administration be, uh, would be arranged under the federal system. The new pact would establish a framework for the state for the next 20 years. The Federalists, nonetheless, defeated the Unitarian forces militarily, which consolidated the power of Rosas, Quiroga and López. However, <clears throat> Quiroga and López were two other fed Federalists, However, the internal dispute about the, uh, how political power would be redistributed led to the dissolution of the Representative Commission. Rosas didn't sanction a federal constitution as his own political power in, in, the, provinces of, in the province of Buenos Aires depended on the portuary province between uh, being the sole connection with the world market. After this period, Rosas left politics to embark on a desert campaign in which he conquered 2,900 leagues of land from the indigenous populations. Charles Darwin was present, was present at these expeditions, and he wrote about his experience, quote, The Indians formed a group of some 110 persons. Almost all were imprisoned or killed, as the soldiers showed mercy to no man. The Indians currently feel such terror that they no longer resist in mass. Each one is pressured to leave separately, abandoning wives and children. Without a doubt, these scenes are horrible, but more horrible is the fact that the soldiers who bring cold-blooded death to the Indians, who look to be just over 20 years old. And when I protested in the name of humanity, I was told, what else can we do? These savages have too many children. This campaign gave Rosas political prestige between the landowners and the population who were part of his campaign. Due to further class clashes in the country between Rosas supporters and the opposition. Following Quiroga's assassination, Rosas was reappointed the governor and he was given supreme command of the executive, legislative and judicial powers. He made many structural changes in all of, in all of these powers by placing his own judges, representatives and even choosing those who would be participating in election. He was killed in battle and this put an end to his federal regime. The generation of 1837, who, was part, who were part of his opposition, would be the ones to, government, to govern in the following period of civil war. So this generation of 1937, they were also known as the Liberals. Uh, this was from 1862 to 1880. Uh, during this period, the presidencies of Bartolomé Mitre, Domingo Faustino Sarmiento and Nicolás Avellaneda laid the foundations of the future nation-state. A new social alliance between businessmen and landowners was consolidated under the interest of increasing agricultural production in order to integrate the nation into the international market. This was a period of centralization, forming a national army, the organization of tax collection on a national scale, the use of a single currency in the whole territory, the organization of the banking system, and replacing the church in the task of civil of uh, the civil registry so up until this time as we said before the civil registry was segregated until 1880 which was uh just over 
I think a hundred and something years ago. From this point on, the state would also manage uh would also manage responsibilities that before were controlled by private entities such as education, colonization, banking, and the construction of a railway network. Between 1862 and 1873, three main political figures played a part in fighting for the autonomy of their provinces. This began with the uprising of the province of La Rioja, led by Ángel Vicente Chacho Peñalosa. Quote, you haven't fulfilled the promises you made many times to the children of this disgraced motherland. The governors have become the butchers of the provinces. They step on the properties of our neighbours and perform extrajudicial, extrajudicial executions on respected citizens for having been members of a federal party, end quote. In the months of May and June, the national forces defeated the Montoneras formed by Chacho. He managed to hang tight against the invading forces until November 12th, when he was taken prison, prisoner and killed by Coronel Irrazaba. In 1866, Felipe Varela, who had been Chacho's lieutenant, reached Chile to join the uprising against the liberal government governors allied to the national government. His flag read, Federation or Death, long live the American Union, down with the slavers, traitors of the motherland. Nice. Since the lib uh, quote, since the liberals usurp the national government, the, mop the monopolization of public funds and the absorption of provincial profits became patrimony for Buenos Aires, condemning us provincianos to seed the very bread that is saved for their children. To be a porteño is to be a citizen with exclusive rights. Porteño would be someone from, from the poor, from Buenos Aires. And to be a provinciano is to be a beggar with no nation. End quote. Varela also, also opposed Argentina's participation in the war against Paraguay because he understood that with that war, the American Union would be destroyed to the benefit of Great Britain. After many years of of growing Montoneras and upscaling conflict, the central government and its allies defeated Varela. He left the country and died in exile on June 4th, 1870. In Entre Rios, Ricardo López Jordán was a caudillo uh, opposed to the political unification and centralization of state authority who received support from Urquiza. When Urquiza was assassinated, the provincial legislature elected López Jordán as the governor of the province. President Sarmiento ordered the provincial police to repress the resistance, defeating López Jordán in 1871. He defied the government again in 1873, after which he was captured along with the other caudillos, who were executed by decree of President Sarmiento. So these three guys, Sarmiento, Avellaneda and Mitre, they were the guys who laid the foundations of Argentina today. We can go further into this. They were pretty, like, they were, they were assholes. They, they, uh, they were what were called the liberals, but they weren't necessarily liberals. I mean, I don't know. The liberal can be a white supremacist, obviously. But if, if for sure, yeah. talking to anyone, if you say they were liberals, they might think, oh, well, maybe they were progressive. No, they weren't progressive. Uh, in their eyes, they were. But we can get into their ideology later on. So the the next part is the Triple Alliance War on Paraguay. <clears throat> this um, is a pretty interesting case uh, because uh, at the time, uh, slavery had been abolished in the US after the end of the Civil War. And the, and the British Empire uh, was looking for cheap cotton elsewhere. But in Paraguay, there were heavy, heavy tariffs on cotton exports. Uh, during the 19th century, Gaspar Rodriguez of France, Carlos Antonio López, and Francisco Solano López closed Paraguay off from com commercial foreign exchange. They were mainly supported by small and medium land landowners and rural artisans, whose interests were affected by commerce with Europe and the U.S., with the objective of making the Paraguayan economy self-sufficient, they propelled development in the agrarian sector, sector and, of in, uh, av, and of artisanal manufacturing, along with some heavy industry, and the creation of the first state locomotor. Paraguay was the only state in the region with such protectionist policies. 
1864, a new con- confrontment between the main political forces in Uruguay, the Whites and the Reds, altered the international balance between Uruguay, Paraguay, Brazil and Argentina. An attempt by a fraction of the Whites to take down the sitting president, also a member of the White Party, awakened suspicions in the Paraguayan government about about the neutrality of the Argentine government. Seeing as General Venancio Flores, chief of the Reds, had fought in Argentina in favor of the liberals and counted on counted on President Mitre's sympathy. So basically, the whites were pro Lopez in Paraguay. So these guys were in Uruguay. The whites were pro Lopez, and the Reds were anti Lopez. Uh, Paraguay asked Argenti- the Argentine government for explanations, but Argentina didn't feel it was an important issue and ignored the overtures. Brazil then mobilized troops to the Uruguayan border and invaded the Eastern Territory in support of the Reds. <clears throat> At this time, Brazil was a, a, the Brazilian Empire. Slavery still existed there. Um, President Francisco Solano Lopez of Paraguay declared that any attempt from a foreign power to occupy occupy Uruguay is an attempt from the foreign forces against the harmony between the states of River Plate. He then asked the Argentine government permission to cross the the province of Corrientes with his troops to stop the Brazilian invasion. President Mitre denied permission, claiming neutrality. Faced with denial on March 5, 1865, Paraguay declared war on Argentina and invaded the province. Two, month, two months later, Argentina, Brazil and the new Uruguayan government signed, signed the Treaty of the Triple Alliance and es- established a united offensive against Paraguay. During the war, due to the lack of human resources, the Paraguayan government cons- even conscripted children between the ages of 10 and 12 years old. When the war began, Paraguay had a million inhabitants and by the time it was finished, this number was reduced to 200,000, mostly women. Following the siege on the Paraguayan capital of Asuncion, Lopez tried to free, flee but was killed in Cerro Corá on March 1st, 1870. As soon as the war ended in December of 1870, the new government in Paraguay declared free commercialization of agricultural products and an opening up of fiscal forests to log in. During the next decades, the concentration of lands to a reduced number of proprietors left thousands of peasant families displaced from their small parcels and had serious difficulties to guarantee survival. The next part is called, I called it, Civilization or Barbary. This was um, the, the slogan from the liberals. So between 1862 and 1880, one of the aspects in the process of imposing quote-unquote order was the disciplining of the indigenous rural population and their subordination to state authorities and established laws. One of the main objectives of the of the government was to eradicate the Montoneras organized by the by the caudillos in the in the countryside. At the same time, quote unquote progress meant the imposition of new labor relations with the objective of turning the undisciplined gaucho into a formidable labor force. They repressed the reunions of what is of what the liberals considered as lazy and up to no good campesinos in the bars in the city and in the campaigns. The peons, countrymen and gauchos experienced these decisions as an abuse from the state and accused them of applying the law whimsically. The government sustained that, quote, the barbarians, end quote, had no right because they didn't respect the law. Many of the accused thought that the government didn't respect the law and lacked the right the rights to apply it. In a letter to Mitre during the conflict with the, with the rural popul- population, Sarmiento praised, quote, the glory of re-establishing in the entire republic the predominance of a, of a cultured class, cancelling the possibility of a mass uprising. In another letter, he recommended, don't try to economize the blood of the gauchos. This is the fertilizer necessary to make a purposeful country. Their blood is the only thing that makes them human beings. End quote. For Sarmiento, liberal principles should be imposed by science and the cane. This was his uh, slogan. Science and the Mitre. cane. Yeah, so science and then you hit him with the cane. Beating the shit out yeah. of people, yeah. Uh, Mitre, Ugh. yeah. 
Yikes. It, this isn't even the worst part. It gets even worse. Oh, and God. Worse and worse. <laughs> <laughs> Mitre in 1868, on his part, affirmed that, quote, it is necessary to educate the people to fight against the ignorance that can defeat us in mass, distorting the means of democracy for the domination of the masses that are unprepared for civil life. And here I have some quotes from some of the, uh, what, what we call the founding fathers of Argentina. Uh, here's one from Sarmiento. Spanish America surely required a second servile race to save the indigenous from destruction, which brings us to reflect much on the strange results given by human combinations, that the independence of the white race eliminated the black race in the entire extension of the continent. And some quotes from then Senator Joaquin B. Gonzalez. The inferior races have been happily excluded from our organism for one or for one reason or the other. We don't have an appreciable quantity of Indians. We don't have Negroes. Those those that were introduced in abundance have all disappeared also. Quote When I speak of inferior races, I do it with complete consciousness, because I because I don't I don't believe that all men are equal in the political sense. Another one, quote, it is well known that this is currently composed by white Europe by a white European population from cultured and civilized origins in the superior races. Another quote from Juan Bautista Alberdi. Now, this guy was uh, quite important in Argentine history. Quote, we are of European race and civilization. We are the masters of America. Uh, in August of 1875, President Avellaneda and his interior minister, Simón de, de Iriondo, presented their project to the Chamber of Deputies called the Immigration and Colonization Law, sustaining that although everyone was convinced the European immigration constituted the most adequate form of securing prosperity un until the few advances had been made, as much in legislation as and as the intention to attract populations that were adequate to the country's needs. Until now, immigration hadn't been imposed, despite Article 25 of the Constitution stating that the government would foment European immigration to the country and authorities would accept those who wanted to come to the Republic. And in their inter internal internalization and administration, Considerable sums are invested without exam qualification or even investigating as to if the immigrant will be use a useful settler who with his work will augment the country's production and contribute to the fermenting of public wealth and at the same time their customs and education contrib contributed to cons consolidating civilization, order and peace. In the bill presented, this problem was evaded as it didn't include spontaneous immigration, but instead looks to the north of Europe and other countries further south, where it was easier to find con the conditions that they were looking for. Farming colonies in which entire villages from different parts of the European countryside, countryside would be placed to further develop agricultural the agricultural system. So basically they were accepting anyone from Europe who wanted to come? Is that uh, Article 25 of the Const Constitution specifically states that um, European immigration is to be fermented. So um, if, if you were from anywhere else, you had to justify, uh, you had right. to have a qualification, you had to, that's why, uh, another reason why so many African descendants uh, or African immigrants who came here by their own will were actually very cultured people. They were doctors, musicians, uh, and that's because why they had to they, prove themselves. Yeah, so that's why uh, we have such a rich culture, and and a lot of our culture, uh, we the, most people don't know. A lot of our culture actually comes from our uh, African descendants. Uh, even huh. even the the tango uh, originates from from it used to be called milonga, which is a an African word, uh, milonga. There's also a Quilombo, which means mess for some reason, but it's actually an African <laughs> dance as well. Uh, Mondongo, which was the parts of the meat that were thrown away that then the, the, the Africans would eat. And it's part of a national food that we eat on the 25th of May. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of things that, that originate from, from African culture. Oddly then, enough, there is, there is a restaurant here in Colorado Springs where you can get Mondongo. Really? 
I don't yeah, like it's not, even, it's, it's not even a it's not even an Argentinian restaurant. It's a it's like a Mexican restaurant. They have a like a chili. That's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. So the next part here uh, is about the territorial integration. Um, this was called the War on the Indian or the Conquest of the Desert. Another another aspect of the process of centralization of the state's authority was the delimitation and control of the national frontiers by the military forces of the government. The integration of the territory of the uh, to the Argentine Republic consolidated itself after confronting two types of conflict. From the period of Rosas until the war on Paraguay, the authorities in charge of foreign policy successfully confronted various neighboring foreign and European states who intended to have the rights of sovereignty over certain portions of what was considered Argentine territory. The other conflict, which became more acute and permanent starting from the decade of 1820, was the war against the indigenous peoples on the country's southern frontier. Between 1862 and 1880, as the state consolidated new institutions and new resources, it was in better conditions to consolidate its dominance over the most faraway regions. At the same time, the, the incorporation of new terrains, which were quickly made to begin production, meant obtaining new sources from the resources needed to advance in the strengthening of the state. There is a series of factors that permitted a definitive success in advancing the, the border to the south and southeast. The landowners in Buenos Aires had more and more influence on the government and were directly tied with the interests expulsing the indigenous. This period was met with the necessity of incorporating new lands to lessen the consequences of the economic crisis produced by the fall in wool exports. Another, ex another factor was the race with Chile to conquer these lands. So the government was preoccupied with advancing over the Patagonian territory to stop the Chilean expansion. Besides the professionalization of the army's reach and the possibility of using trains and telegraphs ensured a high efficiency in military op operations. During Avellaneda's presidency, the, the advance on the frontier was done in two stages. The first until 1877 was an advance in accord with the Minister of War, Adolfo Alcina, until his death on that same year. The plan consisted in constructing a line of forts interlinked by trenches in the territory that had been won back by the indigenous. The construction of the trenches ha had the objective of, of, um, of strengthening the occupation. It didn't guarantee a military victory, but it played a defensive role against the stealing of livestock. Alcina supposed that if they couldn't take any livestock, the indigenous people would just seize their attacks. Now, after 1877, General Julio Argentino Roca, who wasn't in favor of the policy of integration put forward by Alcina, as the new minister of war, imposed his method in a much more aggressive campaign. He, he proposed confronting the First Nations directly with all of the disposable military power and forcing them to relocate further south. By 1881, the objective had been accomplished by support subordinating 14,000 indigenous people and incorporating 15,000 leagues of land to the territory under the control of the nation state. By the end of this century, the contact between the Spanish or Creole society and indigenous society intensified with the establishment of a fluent system of commerce combining looting and robbery. This presented the white population with a double advantage, ensuring their commercial benefits and relative pacification. On part of the indigenous, these circuits ensured a supply of agricultural and artisanal goods that were essential to the pastoral system they had developed. Both economies ha became complementary to each other between livestock production and the indigenous economy which required these products and wide extensions of land for, pa for pastoral work. These contacts brought them with profound and parallel social, social cultural transformations for the indigenous communities. By the end of the 19th century, they even experienced a, a growing militarization, enriching and strength strengthening of the power of the chiefs and caciques. This peaceful coexistence became ever more troubled when the, when the control of the plains on part of the nation state intensified. The lands expropriate from, the, from indigenous con control consolidated the livestock industry's territorial property. The most economically empowered landowners 
had a great deal of influence on the decisions made by the government and often was an obstacle to the objective the state legislature had for a more equal distribution of land. Another factor during another factor during this time was that at this point in time, Argentina was lacking in social groups that claimed access to the land, unlike what was seen in the United States or Australia. But beside this, there was an economic reason why the expansion of livestock production was the most efficient way of incorporating these virgin lands into the productive system. The state disposed of enough resources to foment colonization and depended on the sale of fiscal lands to pay the foreign debt. In, in general, the cost and risk of productive installments in the new lands were assumed by the biggest livestock producers from the province of Buenos Aires, who disposed of the necessary capital. The survivors of the so-called conquest of the desert were, quote, civilly, end quote, tra- translated, walking with shackles on their ankles for f- 1,400 kilometers from the confines of the Andes towards the Atlantic ports. Um, so on the way to these ports, uh, so they would walk from, from what is almost Chile to Buenos Aires. And on the whole way to these ports, there were four concentration camps, uh, where they would be put until the end of the the conflict. The Welsh settler, John Daniel Evans remembers this, uh, a sinister, uh, this sinister place, uh, in Valchet, uh, called a concentration camp near Valcheta in Rio Negro. Quote, In this complex, I believe most Indians come from the Patagonia. They were trapped by a tall wire fence. In the yard, the Indians wander around trying to recognize us. They knew we were Welshmen from the valley of Chubut. While clinging to the wire with their large bony hands dried up by the wind, some tried to communicate in Spanish and some in Welsh. Poco vale, señor. Poco vale, señor. Or a bit of bread, please, sir. End quote. Oh, Shit. That's my place. Um, yeah. And this, like, I think people tend to imagine that the that concentration camps were an invention of Adolf Hitler or that they began in the 20th century, but uh, they they did not. Hitler was inspired by this. He was inspired yeah. by the by the um, uh, manifest destiny. Yeah, he says it in my yeah. camp. Yes, yeah, for sure. Um, and you know, the the British used concentration camps in uh, the Boer Wars in uh, what was that nineteen fourteen, like the early twentieth century. It's yeah, yeah, it's not and good. The U.S. uses them today as well. Yeah. Fact. Right now, currently, it's unfortunately, great. there's way too much uh, emphasis on the Chinese use of concentration camps, but I think yeah. it just uh, it just changes the the narrative from what is really happening. Right, 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 and and that's like the the frustrating thing is we all know that these concentration camps exist here. Uh, people go there and they take pictures of of children in cages and we know what the conditions are. Um, And yet people are reticent to call those concentration camps, but they will refer to the like uh, re-education centers where the, the like Uyghur um, populace are being held as concentration camps, even though we also have pictures of those and they're very nice and clean and and we know that the Uyghurs get to go home on the weekends, that they're there because not because they are Muslim, but because they are they have harbored, um, you know, extremist terrorist um, positions and therefore uh, are, are being reeducated as they ought to be rather than, you know, imprisoned, uh, locked away, rotting in a, in a fucking cage. Um, but but the the like w- everyone calls those concentration camps, even though like the uh, the uh, the CPC invited a bunch of Western journalists to visit. Um, and Joel, I know you know this because I'm pretty sure I read it on your page, uh, or maybe maybe as President Xi delete this account mm-hmm. anyway, um, where a bunch of Western journalists were invited to visit these places to to interview the the detainees 
um, to check the conditions, to to see that they were not prison camps, labor camps, concentration camps, nothing of the sort. And these journalists were like, we don't want to be tacitly supporting uh, the the detention of these individuals, which is what would happen if we went and reported on them. So we're just going to continue to talk shit without any sort of investigation. Um, yeah. But anyway, but that has to mean they know that they're lying. Yes, about the of course, right? because if they go and they see that it's not the things that they've already said, they if are. They can't report that it's not right. Or, then, and they can't report that it is. Then. Right. Exactly. Western media is a but fuck. How do we how do we get people to accept like the American concentration camps as being what they are? Like how yeah. why why is there <laughs> why is there such a no like, idea. case? You could do a whole episode on that. We could do a whole episode on that. <laughs> oh, why is there such a case uh for them saying that they're not technically concentration camps or they're not like like because, they're not definitionally concentration camps? Because the camp. US can't be the bad guy. They never can be. Mm. Never can be the bad guy. It's impossible. It's so frustrating. <laughs> well, I can continue yeah. on a bit on the. <laughs> on Back this, to the subject. Uh, the, the official detour podcast. On the on the genocide. Um, Yikes! So, the survivors set out from there to the port of Buenos Aires in a long and arduous journey, full of horrors for those who hadn't gotten to know the seaside before. Children held on to their mothers who had no way of explaining such barbaric violence. A select group of men, women and child prisoners was paraded in chains through the streets of Buenos Aires directed to the port. To stop this humiliation, a group of anarchist militants interrupted the parade, shouting dignity and the real barbarians are those who put them in chains. In an emotional applause for the prisoners that managed to ruin the fest... uh, for the prisoners who man- and managed to ruin the festive and patriotic mood that was intended to be imposed by the shameful victory parade. From the port, the defeated were translated to a concentration camp based in Martin Garcia Island. From there, they were newly transported and deposited in the immigrant hotel, where the ruling classes at the time would split the booty amongst themselves, as announced by the newspaper El Nacional, that was published the title Indian Handout on Wednesdays and Fridays, the the handing out of Indians to the families of this city through the Beneficent Society. The Beneficent Society. Um, it would it would become customary and quote frankly fun end quote for the ladies of high society voluntarily and eternally unoccupied by the patriarchal comp- confines of matr- matrimony to take trips to the hotel in search of children to give as gifts and maids, cooks, and all forms of civility to be taken advantage of. In another article, the same El Nacional newspaper described the barbarity of the ladies of beneficence who were benefiting from the handing out of, of human beings as servants, destroying entire families. Quote, The desperation and wailing doesn't stop. The children are taken away in front of their mothers to be handed out, ignoring the screams, howls and kneeling pleas with waving arms of the Indian mothers. Seeing that image in raw human form caused some to cover their faces while others look down at the ground in resignation. The mother squeezes against her breast the child from her womb. The father stands in front to defend his family. The promoters of civilization, tradition, the family and private property have stripped these people of their traditions and properties. And now they were they were going for their families. The men were sent north as, is, as an enslaved workforce to labor in the logging camps or sugar plantations. Father Birot, a priest from Martin Garcia, said the Indian feels so much when he's separated from his children, from his wife, because in his native land, all the feelings from his heart are concentrated into his family life. The military objectives had been accomplished. Time had come for the repartition of national patrimony. The public auction law of December 3rd, 1882 granted 5,473,033 hectares to speculators. The law number 1552, ironically named possession rights, rewarded 820,000 hectares to 150 proprietors. 
the military awards law of September 5th in 1885 handed in 4,679,510 hectares of the provinces of La Pampa, Rio Negro, Neuquén, Chubut, and Tierra del Fuego to 541 high-ranking army officials. The cherry on the cake arrived in 1887. A special law from the Na National Congress granted the leader of the desert campaign, General Roca, with another 15,000 hectares. If we crunch the numbers, this is the, resu this is the result. The so-called conquest of the desert served to give away or sell off for pennies a total of 41,787,023 hectares in just 27 years to 1,843 landowners tightly linked economically or through family to the different governments that took power in that period. Of course, those who sacrificed their bodies, the soldiers, obtained nothing from the repartition. The true owners from, of those lands from which they were savagely displaced, received the following handouts. Numuncuranes people, six leagues of land. The chiefs of Pichuinca and Trapailaf, six leagues of land. Saiweke, 12 leagues. In total, 20 leagues of land in sterile and isolated zones were what was left for these nations. Nothing would ever be the same in the conquered territories. No trace to be left of the, present, of the presence of the, quote, savages. As Osvaldo Bayer recalls, quote, the poetic names that, are, that the original inhabitants used for the, for the mountains, lakes, and valleys were replaced by the names of generals and bureaucrats from the Buenos Aires government. One of the most beautiful lakes of the Patagonia, baptized in Tehuelchetang as the Eye of God, was replaced by that of Gutierrez, a bureaucratic interior minister that paid the military salaries. And in Tierra del Fuego, the lake called the Resting Place of the Horizon was renamed Monsignor Fagnano in honor of the priest who accompanied the troops with a cross. Jesus. This is a translation of an article from El Historiador. Then we have the next period. Um, well, it was it was all in the same in the same uh, period about around 1880. During this time, yeah. there was a deepening mod modernization of the economy and society. In some regions of the country, the transformations were provoked by the expansion of the capitalist mode of production and new forms of organizing agricultural and livestock production were destined to the international market. An increase in, value of, in the value of land originated from the colonization of agriculture in Santa Fe and had the expansion of livestock production in Buenos Aires and from the expansion of livestock production in Buenos Aires which after 1860 made the owners of the land maintain their properties. This decision prevented the, the growth of small and medium rural landowners. In Santa Fe, the new settlers weren't the owners of the land anymore. Instead, they became leaseholders. They signed a contract with the proprietors through which they would lease parcels of land under the obligation of exploiting it to, to pay a fee to the proprietors. At the same time, Buenos Aires saw an increase in sharecropping. The sharecroppers, mainly immigrants, would sign a contract through which the landowner would cede the exploitation of parcels in exchange for proportional divis division of profits. Starting in 1870, the sharecroppers began to transform into salaried workers for the landowners. In this period, the potential value of the land increased constantly as a result in the changing mode of agricultural production and the growth of the internal market. An increase in foreign labour power from the immigrations the expansion of internal transport and favorable perspectives on exporting grains. This process consolidated the power of those landowners in the old plains of Buenos Aires, Santa Fe and Cordoba and those from the new plains as the, as the southern and western territories were named in Buenos Aires and La Pampa. So this was basically the formation of the Argentine ruling class and mm. it's the same ruling class we have today. Um, Later on, we'll see uh, that the birth of the industrial capi capitalist class, and basically today Argentina is still uh, a primary resource exporter. It's the least industrialized of the three industrialized nations in South America, so it would be Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina. Um, but be but here in Argentina. As, as well as in these other countries, there's always a struggle between the feudal lords, which is what they are, 
uh, and and the capitalists, um, mm. and a constant effort to stop progress, to stop uh, the development of of uh, of our society by these right. people who are the people who are in power. They're the people who control the country, and they're also the people who we will see in the second part uh, when we talk more about imperialism. They're the people who welcome imperialist forces. And they were they they were from the from day one, they were the people that were with the Spanish colonial uh, powers. And you're talking about the like sort of, uh, I guess, feudal landowners. Yeah, it would be sort of a semi-feudal uh, system, like I said before, with the parcels. But sure. it's different to the U.S. because in the U.S. there was a Je- Jeffersonian law that said that. If you were uh, working in a parcel with someone else, then that that plot of land would become yours eventually. Yes, uh, yeah, that, here in that's, Argentina, that's, yeah, here that, it doesn't exist. That and and it's interesting though because that did not apply to indigenous people who did, uh, you know, quote unquote, mix their 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 work with the soil. Um, it it that's what happened to. They referred to them as the the civilized tribes um, in the southeast of the United States who had essentially adopted all of the capitalist like modes of doing things in, in a in a broad sense. They had started to you know settle in a particular location um, uh, to 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 perform agriculture for the purpose of export. Um, they had started to to construct their own mills and um you know whatever production production facilities to process their their grain and whatnot um and yet they were still packed up and moved along the the trail of tears and i and i think there's like a um th- there are a lot of differences obviously um between the united states and argentina but but the the moving of indigenous populations from their ancestral lands to basically barren nothingness uh is a thing that happened here in the US uh often um you know initially it was to Oklahoma um but Oklahoma was then too productive and so they pushed a huge huge number of them out of Oklahoma as well um but you know i don't know <laughs> It's awful. Yeah, it's pretty terrible. Like the whole point of this was uh, to to make it understood that uh, Argentina is a settler state. It is a white supremacist state from its very foundations. Sure. Um, and uh, we have we have a lot of of left parties here. You know, uh, mainly the, the the biggest left parties here are Trumpists. Oh and, no! <laughs> and it's uh, bleep. Sorry, bleep skis. And it's um. <laughs> I'll do that for you. You don't have yeah, to worry about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to uh, it's hard to to put that forward. You know, the 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 liberation of the oppressed peoples is essential to any proletarian revolution. And yes, it can't be left. It can't be left to the side. I mean, absolutely. If you want a revolution, I mean, these guys are the ones who created the bourgeois society here in Argentina, specifically with the the need for uh, the the uh, the need for an ability to stop a mass uprising. I mean, that right. was the the whole the whole uh, foundation of our state. Yikes! Well, yeah, I'd like to thank you all for. Uh, inviting me onto the show i hope it was a good one i'm sorry if it was uh a bit a bit difficult to um to formulate how i was saying things because a lot of these are translated directly from the sources um, no that's good actually because I'll, I'll, you know i mean we we don't have access to any of that um right. which may which may make our resources uh section a little bit sparse but light yeah yeah um all right so um yeah, I guess that's it. Uh, our sponsors are all of our excellent fans on Patreon. As always, we have too many to read each time now. But since the last time we recorded, these are the new ones. We have 
Barxist Lemonist. Christ. <laughs> God damn it. Cammy. Connor. Groovy. Jacob. Jake. Joseph. Joshua. Leo. Manda. Micah. Norman Daler. T Toddler. And Walter. All of these people are inspiring and revolutionary and make it easier for us to make this podcast for you and have it sound good. A bunch of our patrons have started a bunch of split off <laughs> like uh, podcasts and they're all good and they're all fantastic. Um, one of them is Pearls of the Book Club, uh, where they're reading through Capital. It's pretty fantastic, especially if you've never read it. Um, they kind of talk it through amongst themselves, which gives like a lot of different perspectives on the text, uh, which is really enlightening. We've got Pearls of the Minion, um, which is specifically focused on uh, the perspective of Jewish Marxist Leninists. We have uh, the Tolerant Left, uh, which is a couple of comrades who I, they, they, they tend to focus on particular ideological issues, not necessarily theory or history focused um more modern perspectives on issues from a marxist from perspective. Uh, obviously well yeah. duh duh <laughs> we wouldn't advertise it otherwise <laughs> we would yeet them into the sun if yes. they did not um so anyway uh we also want to thank ransom notes for our intro music check him out on soundcloud uh please don't forget to rate and review visit pearlspod.com like us on facebook.com slash pearlspod and follow us on twitter at pearlspod if you have any feedback topic ideas, or suggestions, feel free to send us an email at pearlspod at gmail.com or in the comment box on our website. Thanks for tuning in. Solidarity. Solidarity, Solidarity forever. forever. Para no hacer de mí con un pedazo, para salvarme entre un hijo e impares, para hacerme un lugar en su parnazo, para dar un concito en sus altares, me vienen a convidar a arrepentirme, me vienen a convidar a que no pierda. Me vienen a convidar a indefinirme, me vienen a convidar a tanta mierda. Yo no sé lo que es el destino, caminando fui lo que fui. Haya Dios que será divino, yo me muero como Yo me muero como viví, yo me muero como viví. Quiero seguir jugando a lo perdido Yo quiero ser a la surda más que diestro Yo quiero hacer un congreso del unido Yo quiero rezar a fondo un hijo nuestro Dirán que pasó de moda la locura Dirán que la gente es mala y no merece Yo partiré soñando travesuras ¿Acaso multiplicar panes y peces? Yo no sé lo que es el destino Caminando fui lo que fui 
Ay, adiós, ¿qué será divino? Yo me muero como viví Yo me muero como viví Yo me muero como viví Como viví, como viví, yo me muero como viví, como viví, yo me muero como viví. Dicen que me arrastrarán por sobre rocas Cuando la revolución se venga abajo Que machacarán mis manos y mi boca Que me arrancarán los ojos y el badajo Será que la necedad parió conmigo La necedad de lo que hoy resulta necio La necedad de asumir al enemigo Necesidad de vivir sin tener precio Yo no sé lo que es el destino Caminando fui lo que fui Ay, Dios que será divino Yo me muero como viví Yo me muero como viví Yo me muero como viví 